Hi, I'm Mike Sullivan, and you're watching Medfield.tv. Access to our community. I'm Alex Steven on Live Your Passion. And on this show, we are bringing guests to you, the audience, to share their story, their challenges, and how they overcame them. To share with you their wisdoms and, and their experiences so that you will learn something to help you on your journey. This morning, I have a good friend of mine here with me, it's Trisha Bennett. And uh, she will introduce herself and tell you what she does. Welcome, Tricia. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> um, it's really wonderful to be here. And you are a life-transforming treasure, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, uh, Tricia Bennett, I live on Martha's Vineyard. I am married to a wonderful man. And I am a lot of things. I wear a lot of hats. Um, I'm a family therapist. I'm an author, I teach workshops for women, and I hold, um, I'm the small, I own the smallest company in the world to be licensed by the estate of Albert Einstein and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So I have many hats and you'll find out why I wear them all. <laughs> yes. Well, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning, coming all the way from Martha's Vineyard Thank to you. share your story. Coming to America. Coming to America <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, Trish, you could start off by telling us a little bit, you know, you, know, you and I spoke about mm -hmm. your childhood right. and some of the experiences you had so the audience mm -hmm. could get a little background mm. of who Trisha you know, was at that time and how you came along this journey. Yeah, okay. Well, it's interesting because I don't, um, I don't spend a lot of time talking about my childhood these days because I'm so busy, but I had one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, mm. it was kind of a difficult one. And um, I had, my, both of my parents were artists and musicians. They were very talented. They were very successful at their careers. They were both um, classical musicians. Both played with the Boston Symphony, and mm -hmm. my father played around the world doing recordings with other symphonies. And um, we were always surrounded by amazing, talented, just amazing people. And. Uh, my parents both also had the disease of alcoholism, and uh, it killed them both. And it took their lives in really horrible ways. Um, yeah, really horrible ways. And, you know, I guess you know, I feel like my life is so far from that these days that. It's like telling a story when I talk about it, but I think it's important to talk about it because um, everyone has a story. And what I, what I guess I really want the audience to know is that my life is a gift, my life is a love story, even though there was a lot of tragedy in it. And um, the alcoholism actually was so bad in my family that my parents, from the time I was about five years old, my parents didn't know what day it was. They didn't know what year it was or who was president. They would drink until they passed out and then they would wake up and start drinking again. So mm -hmm. all throughout my childhood, my parents never knew what grade I was in. They didn't know what I was studying in school. They didn't know where I was during the day. I could, my mother would come into my room um, in, in the summer at 6 o'clock at night and tell me I needed to get dressed for school. She didn't know what time she didn't it know, was. She didn't know it was summer. She mm. didn't know that the school was out of session. 
So that was tough for you as a child. That was tough, and there was also a lot of violence. My father was very violent. Um, I, I, you know, when I am in certain places in my life, I'll joke about it, and I'll say the only time my parents ever went to the hospital was in an ambulance. They were very violent, and uh, and I was put in foster care when I was 12 because of that, um, yes. because my father was so violent that I was no longer able to live with my parents. Yeah, that, that's tough. And, you know, thanks for sharing that story, mm. because I'm sure there's people who's looking at this show who is going through some similar challenge. Mm -hmm. you know, it may not be alcoholism, but yeah. something that they say, you know, I can't be in this situation. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to survive. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to survive. And yeah. th this is, you know, this is what are you doing now in giving back and helping mm. people who are in a similar situation? Yeah. yeah. And I know, Trish, you shared with me at an early age that your dad shared something with you because he mm. was a spiritual man, despite yeah. the disease. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, being talented. I love musicians. My yeah. daughter has a degree in music, and mm. I, I just lo love music. I, yeah. I can't play anything, yeah. but <laughs> I just love yeah. music. And, um, you know, despite what was going on at home, yeah. he said something to you yeah. that made all the difference in yeah. your life. Mm. Um. Well, mm. I, I brought a picture of my parents to share. This is my mom and dad, and uh, I love them very much. And uh, Beautiful couple. You know, <laughs> one of the things that I really want to say to people is that um, a lot of times in life, people get angry with people. You know, children get angry with their parents for things that happen to them. And what I always try to say to people is try very hard not to be angry with the people. It's okay to be angry about the circumstances. You know, one of the things I do in my adult life is is work to help children living with alcoholic families. Right. And the reason that I do that is because, you know, I can be upset with alcoholism. I can be upset with the disease of alcoholism, but I can love my parents at the same time, even though my, they were both incredibly sick and really not present as parents for most of my life, that I can be upset with the disease but I can take the gifts from my parents. And I remember when I was five, I was in kindergarten and my kindergarten teacher, we were all in the classroom together and she said, okay, today we're gonna talk about what everybody wants to be when they grow up. And the first thing that went through my mind at five years old was alive. Alive. And the second thing that went through my mind was, I bet that's not what that teacher's talking about. Exactly. I bet she wants me to say, I want to be a teacher when I grow up. Or a doctor. Or a doctor yeah. or whatever. Yeah, but it wasn't alive, yeah. you know. But really what was on my mind is, I wonder if my mother's dead. I wonder if my father has burned the house down. And I wonder if he'll break my neck in my sleep tonight. You know, that was mm. really what was going on in my mind. I at wanted five to, years at old. five years old. I just my goal was to be alive as a grown up, and um, so. But the other side of the situation is that my father was an incredibly spiritual man, and he was also, besides being a musician for his career, he was a painter oh, and an artist very and talented. A v very talented. He mm. made gorgeous jewelry and. But he was an amazing oil painter, and he actually sold oil paintings for the symphony to raise money and as fundraisers for the symphony and stuff. And he loved to draw together with, his, with my sister and myself. Mm -hmm. And so when I was about six, he took me out in a field near our house, and the milkweed pods had cracked open, and the little fluffy things were mm -hmm. coming out of the milkweed pods. And he said, let's draw the milkweed. And so we sat with our notepads and our pencils and we drew the, the milkweed and we looked at every little part of the milkweed, the stem and all the little 
hairs coming right. out of the stem and mm -hmm. we looked at the pods and how they cracked open and we looked at each little like parachute with its little seed at the end and talked about how they're dispersed yeah. into the world and and we talked about it for probably 20 minutes and at the end he I thought usually we would do that and at the end of really observing something he would say are you ready to draw and I would say sure and we'd take our pads and our pencils and we'd start to draw and on this particular day I was ready for him to say are you ready to draw and instead of saying that he said I'm gonna tell you something now Patricia and I want you to remember it mm. and he said if anyone ever tells you there isn't a God you tell them they haven't looked closely enough. God is, God is all around us. You know, if yeah. you can't look at that milkweed and think something bigger than we are made that thing, designed it and, yeah. you know, put it together exactly the way it's put together. You know, he said, if you look closely at anything, closely enough at yeah. anything, you'll see God in it. Yeah. And I just thought, Wow, that's where everything comes from. Yeah. You know, it just, I immediately believed him and embraced the concept of, well, of course, nobody, no human person could make could that make milkweed that. plant, yeah. you know. So at six years old, I had this profound understanding of things that were much greater than I could ever understand myself, that there was something out there that was bigger than we are. And he followed that with the quote that I'm going to ask you to read. Yeah, um, yeah. which was know, sort I'm, of his philosophy about life. You know, I'll yeah. just say one more thing, sure, which ahead. is that my parents were very eccentric, obviously. Kind of, you know, what we would call like crazy people. You know, people were afraid of my parents because my dad was so drunk and so violent and so scary. And I always say that my parents were eccentric in a non-user friendly way. <laughs> and my father used to always say, you know, never give a rat's bleep about what anybody thinks of how you live your life. Right. And the, the story behind that is the quote that... Yeah. yeah. I, I, as I told you, when I read this a few times, but when I read it this morning, yeah. it, it just you know, came to me in a different light. I t think it's so powerful that we need to read it to the audience. Right. And it says, listen to God. Listen to God and whatever he tells you, do it as fast as you can and you will have an extraordinary life. Most people will not understand you. Some people will find you interesting and some people will not like you at all. They will be afraid of how you live your life. Don't worry about what anyone thinks about your choices. A very few will want what you have. They will be your friends. If anyone ever tells you there isn't a God, you tell them they haven't looked closely enough. Thomas E. Newell, Jr., 1929 to 1999, to his daughter, Patricia, at age six in 1967. How profound. And you held on to these words mm -hmm. your entire life. This was mm -hmm. your lifeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So. I, you know, I thought it, it's really interesting because um, I, I really believe that there were angels everywhere through my whole childhood and part of that is just because my father said listen to God and whatever he tells you do it as fast as you can and I thought okay you know I mean my dad was a smart guy right. and I thought great if I'm going to have an extraordinary life I'll start listening right now right. you know yeah, at, six, yeah. <laughs> at six and yeah. I feel like I've been listening ever since and mm -hmm. one of the sweetest things that ever happened that was really life transforming for me is that um, my father used to have um, conductors and musicians come from all over the world to sit with him and review music scores and you know a lot of people have said to me that my dad was a really really brilliant man and I think you know sometimes 
art and tragedy go together. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, insanity and the artistic temperament is a common topic mm -hmm. in the arts. And um, lots of people that are very artistic have very tragic lives. And, um, but these people would come from all over the world to study with my father. And they would stay up all night long going over musical scores, blasting classical music throughout our entire house and sitting on the floor in this giant room with scores of music out all over the floor. And one night I heard this screaming downstairs and I thought, oh God, now what? You know, and I went downstairs and I was probably five or six years old and it was three o'clock in the morning and this giant music room was filled with cigar smoke and the music was blasting and a man in a crunched up white sort of tuxedo shirt and pants was sitting on the floor and it was Eric Leinsdorf who was a very famous conductor from mm -hmm. Austria and he was sitting on the floor and my father was raging off into the kitchen to get another you know gallon of vodka to bring into the and I was so humiliated. I just remember thinking, oh my God. And I was in footy pajamas. I mean, I was that young. I was yeah. like four or five years old. And I thought, oh, I can't, even, I can't save this situation no matter what I do. Yeah. You know, at four, I'm thinking, yeah. you know, how humiliated I am. And Eric Leinsdorf is sitting on the floor and he goes like this, Patricia, come here. And he said, sit by me. And he had a very heavy, you know, Austrian accent. And he looked at me and he said, Patricia, your father is a genius. Don't mind him. Wow. And I remember thinking, oh my God, like, uh, this man can see through the blazing alcoholism yeah. to the genius that's inside my father. Mm -hmm. And all the insanity doesn't bother him at all. You know, he's mm -hmm. there to like get every ounce of my father before he self-destructs. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I had people like that throughout my whole life saying to me, I know your dad's a maniac, but suck him dry because he's amazing. He's you amazing. know, yeah, he's amazing. So yeah. you know, it, the the lesson there is to look beyond, you know, the disease Absolutely. or whatever, and look for the good. You know, and that's it, it's be it's fine to be upset with the circumstance. Uh, you know, I didn't like living in a house with no parents. I didn't like worrying about whether the house was going to burn down because somebody left the stove on, yeah. or my father was going to kill my mother. Mm -hmm. But all these amazing people and all the things that my father said to me. It's funny, my dad was dying. He Literally, he was in the hospital and he was dying. Tubes were coming out of his body. And he, I, he died three days after this happened. And he said to me, he said, you know, he always called me Patricia. He said, come sit by me, just like when I was a little kid. <laughs> and he said... I'm sorry I've been so difficult. And I said, Dad, <laughs> I said, believe me, you are no piece of cake, <laughs> but I wouldn't trade you for anything. <laughs> and I meant it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so sweet. And, and what he did there was made peace yeah. with himself and, yeah. and with you before yeah. he left. Yeah. And, and that's so uh. powerful. Yeah. I know both of your, your parents died tragically because of their alcoholism yeah. and that's not easy. Yeah. Uh, but one thing I wanted to ask you as you went through this journey of yeah. your life experience uh -huh. is um, you talk about angels and we yeah. definitely have angels mm -hmm. in our lives and sometimes yeah. we don't recognize them at the moment but in retrospect we like yeah. That person was an angel sent by God at mm -hmm. this specific mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, I want you to talk to the, the audience. There are people in our lives who tell us we cannot do things. Mm -hmm. The people who always want to give you this piece of advice. You yeah. cannot do this. You'll never amount to this. Yeah. And, and, you know, could you share with them some of those experiences? Because I'm yeah. sure 
it happens to all of us and we have to know yeah. in our heart what we want and right. who we are yeah. and what is our purpose right. and this is what we want to share with the audience yeah well um uh, yeah i think you know it's so funny because one of the things about saying you know be upset with the situation but try not to be upset with the people and mm -hmm. get all the gifts that you can from the people is that um uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. How did I get, oh, dealing with negativity. Yeah. So one of the things about um, getting the gifts all you can, uh, that all the gifts you can from the people is that if I had only focused on my parents' alcoholism, I would never have been able to see the parts of them that are gifted mm -hmm. and spiritual and deep and profound and amazingly talented and, okay. you know, and I am my father. I am the living incarnation of my father. <laughs> like everything about him. Is, except the tick eyebrows. Except, <laughs> except the alcoholism. Yeah. I mm. actually stopped drinking when I was 28. I'm 53 years old. Mm. Um, someone asked me if broccoli had killed both of your parents, would you cut it out of your diet? And that made sense to me. Mm. So I cut alcohol out of my diet and I thought you know if I if I don't die like my parents did I can give the world all the gifts that they weren't able to give mm -hmm. and um, people would say to me oh you poor thing both of your parents are alcoholic and I remember at one point when I was really little like eight or ten I looked at this woman who said that to me and I said don't call me a poor thing I said you're a poor thing I'm fine <laughs> yeah. you know it's like I had my father's attitude mm -hmm. about you know don't tell me who I am or that I'm a poor thing like God tells me who I am yeah, and exactly. I'm just fine like there's nothing wrong with me honey and I'm sorry you feel sorry for me but you know I'm okay thanks yeah. and you have to be, you have to be strong <laughs> uh -huh. you have to be strong because there are always going to be people mm -hmm. who want to give you that type of advice yeah. um, right. you have to be strong and know who you are and what yeah. you want in life yeah and so we talk about your den, you know, growing up, what the situation was, yeah. and you give us a little background. Yeah. So share with us a little bit about the how, how you overcame, you know, that situation, you know, some of the things well, you did. I, I feel like I was so fortunate. Well, you know, really, it's the, th the line that my father said to me about, listen to God, because I very soon after that, heard somewhere that God speaks through people mm -hmm. and I thought oh okay then I can listen to people too and God can speak through them so mm -hmm. I don't just have to listen to God through prayer I can listen to God through people mm -hmm. so I realized that I really for all you know intents and purposes did not have parents you know okay. so I started listening to other people and taking their guidance and I allowed other people to help me you know figure out how to get to college and get through college and I allowed other people to sort of guide me in how to live my life right. but I always listened you know I had people saying to me I moved to Martha's Vineyard when I was 28 years old I had been offered a job in Washington DC that was a really high paying job and somebody asked me what would you rather do live in Washington DC and work for the government or live on Martha's Vineyard and walk on the beach and I went hmm I don't know let's see let me think about that for five seconds <laughs> and I moved to Martha's Vineyard when I was 28 you know people would say to me how did you do that and I said I just took early retirement you know <laughs> it's early. like I listened to yeah. God yeah. you know what's my path is my path to go and do this job that everybody else thinks I should do or is my job to trust the voice that speaks to me and tells me time to go do that yeah. and I packed my bags and I moved to Martha's Vineyard and I have a million jobs and I love them all and I haven't regretted it for one second 
So, well, yeah. Well, the, the flip side with my story is that I came from the Caribbean. So mm. people ask me, mm -hmm. how come you left the beaches and mm. the warm weather and mm -hmm. moved to mm -hmm. Massachusetts with, right. you know, we have like 12 inches of snow every right, other day. Right, and, um, right. I love <laughs> it, but I don't day. ski. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's where God puts you in your life. Mm -hmm. You right. got to accept that. You got to listen to that voice. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said. Um, it's not like you have, you got to sit down, meditate and pray and have mm -hmm. that conversation with God. Mm -hmm. But he's everywhere in the yeah. people we meet every day, mm -hmm. the situations that come mm -hmm. up. And it's how we, you know, our perception and how we deal with it. Right. And, and you've done a wonderful job, mm. you know, so now you you're doing all these great things and mm -hmm. i had the pleasure through heidi bertram mm -hmm. your, your um, partner in your business yeah. be more yeah. you yeah. to get to know you a little more right. and be in one of your workshops this weekend my mm -hmm. wife raz and i mm -hmm. and just love the work that you all are doing mm -hmm. I, I i wouldn't call it work it's a service mm -hmm. yeah. you guys are just yeah. given and you yeah. know, thanks for having us to be yeah. a part of that. Yeah. So I'll, I'd like you to talk a little bit to the audience about some of the things you're doing now, giving back because mm -hmm. of your experience. Mm -hmm. So you, you took something that some people consider a tragedy, mm -hmm. like the woman who said, oh, you poor thing. Oh, you poor and thing. You, you didn't yeah. buy into yeah. that. It's yeah. like, no, I am better than this. That's kind of rude to her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> you know, you were eight or ten, yeah. so you excused. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew what I was <laughs> doing. Yeah, you knew you were doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the thi <laughs> you know, the, the thing, is, we have to know what it is we want yeah. and look for the good in situations. Mm -hmm. Look for the good in situations and you, I will say, turn it around. Mm. You could have said, mm -hmm. okay, my parents die of alcohol, I'll do the same. And yeah. you said, no, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. going to stand for that. Yeah, right. And you found ways at an early age. Mm -hmm. And what, what your dad gave you, you know, those words were golden. I know, you, yeah. you kept them mm -hmm. close to your heart. And what's even better, what's even better is that you are sharing them mm. with people. Mm -hmm. So if you could share with us some of the projects, some of the things you're doing now to help mm. children and women mm -hmm. and people on their journey? Well, um, I, I always, I, I love the expression, you can't keep it unless you give it away. And I feel that way about all the gifts that I've been given in my life. I believe that, um, I believe in the idea of paying it forward and yes. you know the minute mm. i get something i want to give it to other people i want to share it and um, i wrote a, a manual for um, working with children from alcoholic families back in the 80s working for young children from alcoholic families and it is still the only resource available for working with preschool and kindergarten children mm. around the world who are living in um, alcoholic or addicted family systems and i have done trainings all over the country for um, early childhood professionals and pediatricians and um, therapists and, and treatment centers who work with families with young children, people who are in recovery. And it's so gratifying. I have, I get letters from all over the world from people saying that, you know, I got a, my favorite one is from an Inuit community in Alaska that told me that they have a 97% adult alcoholism rate and that their entire community is changing because they're using my manual with the children in their community. That everyone is learning about alcoholism and to love the people and to be upset about the disease and to take the, the gifts and, yeah. you know, so it's just, it's a huge <laughs> gift to be able to give my experience. And I always say, you know, to the extent that your pendulum swings in life, to the extent that you have experienced grief or suffering, you can, to the same extent, experience mm. joy and give gifts right. to the same degree. Yeah. So the fact that I lived with parents who were so sick and debilitated, but so wonderful at the same time, I can understand people who are living in those same situations. Mm. So that feels like a huge gift to me. It feels like I know why I was born into that family. I was born into that family to give that gift, to make it more comfortable for people to help children 
and their parents right. in a very uncomfortable situation. Right. So yeah. you, you found out what your purpose was. Mm -hmm. And instead of being hard on yourself or your parents, you use it or using it yeah, to help I said, people. how can I turn this into something <laughs> right. that can make a difference, yeah. that can stop suffering, that can, right. you know, allow people to see the beauty in the tragedy. Exactly. You know, it's like the, you know, they say it takes a lot of manure to grow a flower. <laughs> you know, it's like in a pile of manure, little things pop, pop up, up, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of like looking for the beauty in those look things. Look for the beauty. And that's yeah. what we want the audience yeah. to get is that you've got to look for the beauty, as Trisha said, mm. in, in whatever situations and challenges you have in life. Mm -hmm. And as I, I was getting prepared for the show, I spoke to a few of my coaching clients mm. and other people that I network with. And I said, uh, you know, I was talking about you and I said, have you ever seen the bumper sticker grace happens uh -huh. and i was surprised everybody knew even my wife yeah. my wife said yeah I, i've seen that and i yeah. said oh patricia bennett she's gonna be on my next show yeah. so you will so yeah. everybody who's watching it's a secret don't tell anyone <laughs> 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 you know i um about 20 years ago um, I made this bumper sticker. A little boy and I got together with his mom. We used to have what we called art afternoons. And mm. one day we decided to make bumper stickers. And mm. I asked him, he was about eight, and I asked him if he would write Grace Happens, because I loved that expression, mm. if he would write it on a bumper sticker for me. And so he wrote it on the bumper sticker for me. And it was in black magic marker, and he wrote, drew, uh, drew spikes all mm. over the letters. Mm. So I took it home and I cut all the spikes off the letters and I turned them into a star. And I made a bumper sticker with an Albert Einstein quote that said, how I wish that somewhere there existed an island for those that are wise and of goodwill. And I took it to a printer on the vineyard and I had them turn it into a sticker for his eighth birthday. And you know, this is sort of the power of listening to God. Yes. And I thought, you know, it's kind of silly to spend a hundred bucks on an eight-year-old, but what the heck? Like the voice said, oh, go ahead and go do ahead it. And do go it. ahead and do it. Yeah. So I made this bumper sticker with a little artistic drawing on it that this boy had made, and I gave it to him for his eighth birthday, and he took it to his, his school and gave it out to all of his friends. And literally two days later, the Black Dog Catalog called me, which is the biggest company on Martha's, on Martha's Vineyard. Vineyard. If you go yeah. anywhere in the world, you know what the Black Dog t-shirts look like and everything. Right. And the woman who um, was in charge of the Christmas catalog was on the phone. And she said, are you the woman who made that bumper sticker that says Grace Happens on it? And I said, yeah, that, that's me. And she said, well, I'd love to put that in our Christmas catalog. And I said, geez, you know, I really hadn't thought about mm -hmm. selling it. You know, I just made it for a birthday present for yeah. this little boy. But I did what I always do. I said a quick little prayer. And the voice said, eh, go ahead. God, God and I speak colloquially to yeah. one another. And I said, okay, fine. So I then knew that I was going to have to pay royalties to somebody because I didn't know who collected royalties for Einstein, but I knew somebody did, and that if I was selling it, I was gonna have to pay somebody. So a friend of mine had a wall calendar that I had given her son with Albert Einstein photographs and quotes on it, because he was a fan of Einstein. Mm -hmm. And I um, called my friend up and I said, could you do me a favor and look on the back of that calendar and tell me who published it? so that I can call them and ask them who they yeah. pay royalties to. Yeah. So I called the company, they told me, I called the, well, no, I called the company and they said, can you fax a copy of it to us? And I said, sure. I thought it was kind of strange, but I did it. So the guy on the end of the phone says, there's somebody here who's gonna wanna talk to you. So I said, okay. So a few minutes later, the phone rings, and there's a woman on the other end of the line, and she says, who are you anyway? And I said, my name is Trisha Newell at the time. I said, I made this bumper sticker for a little eight-year-old boy. And she said, I'm, I'm going to call you back. And I said, okay. 
So about an hour later, my phone rings and she says, I'm going to give you a phone number. And next Tuesday at 2 a.m., I want you to dial it. And she said, you're going to speak with some rabbis in Jerusalem. And she said, and I'm also going to tell you that you are never to give this phone number to anyone. And do, do those were the rule three phones then? You said dial in. No, well, dial it. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still say dial, <laughs> yeah, okay. but um, I'm old. <laughs> but, um, you know, she said, she said, and you're never to give this phone number right. to anyone as yeah. long as you live, do you understand me? And I'm thinking, this is really kind of freaky. I just made this bumper sticker, <laughs> and now I'm being told to call these rabbis in Jerusalem on Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the morning. So I said, okay, because this is how God works. Yes. This is like, listen to God and you will have an extraordinary life. Exactly. Not just an okay life, but like kind of a ridiculous okay. life. So I expect, you know, there's a great quote, um, I don't believe in miracles, I count on them. Yeah. You know, like I expect them. Yeah. And um, so the next Tuesday morning, I got up at one, I made a pot of tea, and I dialed the phone, and this rabbi answered the phone. And I said, this is, you know, Trisha Newell, I'm calling from Martha's Vineyard. And he said, ah, yes, my dear, we have been expecting you. And I was like, I mean, you know, I had goosebumps, as my mm. friend Heidi would say, goosebumps on goosebumps. <laughs> and, um, and I said, you know, he said, so tell me about grace. And to make a very long story, I spoke with a panel of rabbis for two hours. They asked me all kinds of questions about grace and why I believed in grace and why I included Albert Einstein, who most people consider a scientist, with a spiritual concept. And I told them that my parents had known someone who Einstein had fired because he didn't believe in God. And everything that I said to these rabbis was translated into Hebrew, and they would ask another question, and I would answer it, and they'd all start laughing. And at the end of the conversation, they said, the first thing we want you to know is that we think you should do this for your life. They mm. said, you should talk about grace for your life. He said, this is, you know, your job, is to talk about mm. the gift that life is. Mm. And he said, and the second thing we want you to know is that we were friends with Albert Einstein. And if he were living today, he would be standing on the street corner selling these stickers with you. Oh, wow. And he said, we're going to give you a number to call. And he said, you call them and you tell them to give you a license. And if you have any problems, you tell them we sent you. So the next day, so I'm thinking, this is too much. Yeah. You know, I just got ordained by a panel of rabbis in Jerusalem, and now I'm supposed to call this number the next day. So I call the number the next day. A woman answers the phone. She's the president of the company that manages the estate of Albert Einstein. And she says, who are you anyway? And how did you get my phone number? And I said, I got it from the rabbis in Jerusalem. And there was dead silence, silence on the other end of the phone. And she said, you talked to the rabbis and I said yeah last night for two hours and she said no one in the world has the number for the rabbis so I can't tell you the names of anyone that I spoke with because I promised I wouldn't for the rest of my life right. but I hold I'm the smallest company in the world you know scientific and scientific American and Hallmark get to use Einstein stuff with multi-million dollar contracts and I get to use his quote because the rabbis told me I got to you use could. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. So I get letters from priests and ministers and rabbis all over the world. I, you know, talk to them on the phone. They ask if I can send them, you know, 50 or 100 for their congregation to put in their missiles or, you know, I have like the most amazing conversations of my life because I made a bumper sticker for an eight-year-old yeah. because I listened. You listened. Yeah. And you took the direction. You took the action. Mm -hmm. You didn't just listen and question and yeah. analyze and yeah. overanalyze. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the key. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's the key. Wow, that's very powerful. I didn't know the depth of mm. that story. Yeah. Uh, very, very powerful. So you want to share with us anything else you do? Um, well, I'd love to just say a little bit about Be More You. And sure. I know you had yeah. Heidi here, yeah. and you know, it it goes right along with the whole thing about um, once you're given a gift, to give it away. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things I realized about life, coming from an alcoholic family, is that you don't always get all the tools in your toolbox that you need for living. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, you know, you can learn how to speak French. You can learn how to do math. You can learn how to do a lot of things by going to the right teachers. Mm -hmm. And I always, I really wanted to be married and I didn't know how to do it. And I thought, maybe I can learn it, just like I learned to speak French. You know, and I started asking really happily married women if they would be willing to guide me toward being married. And it took 15 years for me studying with all of these wonderful women before I met a wonderful man. And Heidi and I partnered up about eight years ago to give all that wisdom away to women. Mm -hmm. So it's another area of my life that brings me incredible joy. You know, not only am I married to a wonderful man, not only do I have a huge community, including you now, <laughs> yeah. of incredibly mm -hmm. happily married mm -hmm. people that support me, but I can now teach that to other women. Right. So I love the idea of everything coming full circle and using your gifts to... L using the gifts yeah, and using sharing gifts. And, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and helping, helping people. Yeah. So having said that, you use a, a word there that I want to bring up. What yeah. tools will you like to share with the audience? You know, a couple of tools you'd mm -hmm. like them to, mm -hmm. to, you'd like to give us takeaways today. Yeah. Well, I guess I would say the first thing is, um, to, you know, no matter what happened to you in life, no matter what has happened to you, no matter what your current circumstances are, try to allow for the possibility that your life is a gift, that everything that has ever happened to you, that everything that's happening now is a gift, and that it's a gift that you can use to share with other people to make their journey easier, more joyful, and um, to know that they're not on the journey alone. You know, just know that everything about you and who you are is a gift. And, you know, I also say to the women that I work with all the time and to the people in my therapy practice, if something in your life isn't working, it doesn't mean that you're broken. It just means there's a skill or two that you haven't learned yet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. anything can be learned. So find the people that have it and ask them to teach you. It's it's really that simple. Yeah. yeah. And when you ask people, they're willing to help. That's been my experience. Yeah. People are willing to help, yep. you know, once yep. you you ask. Yep. So so Trisha here, yeah. you know, from what I'm hearing in this conversation is it's important to listen. It's important to look beyond the mm. circumstances mm -hmm. and what you see and, and go deeper yeah. and look for the gifts. Yeah. And whatever God gives to you, whatever talents, whatever mm. gifts, it's important to share mm -hmm. it. And I, if I could, sure. I'd just like to say that for those of you who aren't practiced at listening to God, that there's a wonderful little homework assignment that you could take on, which is when you wake up in the morning, ask God for two things that he wants you to do during the day. And it might be as simple as go to the post office and pay the electric bill. But listen, listen to the voice that comes to you and try to do those things. And you'll notice that things that were unexpected will happen around those simple chores. Yeah. And the more you practice that, you know, listen to God and do two things a day that he asks you to do, the more you'll learn to trust that voice mm -hmm. so that when you have really important decisions to make, yeah. you'll know what voice to listen to yeah. when you ask. Yeah, yeah. very so, powerful. Yeah. And, and when, you know, look for the good in situations. Look for the gift. Look for the gift, mm -hmm. listen, yeah. listen to people, listen yeah. to God. 
And I love it when you say, because that's one of my mantras, mm. I expect miracles every day. Right. And once you expect it, it's going to yeah. come. Yeah. So, yeah, there was a little quote yesterday. We always hand out little things for the mm. women to open up to mm. read. And there was a little quote um, the other day that um, the only people who see miracles are those who believe in them. Yeah. You gotta believe. If you're not it. looking for them, you won't see you them. Won't see yeah. them. <laughs> you won't see them. You won't see them. So, yeah, pretty, pretty good. Um, yeah. You know, thanks a lot. This you're welcome. Been very, thanks for very, having very me. Very good. So, yeah. I want to ask you at this point if there's anything else you'd like to share in closing um, w with the audience. A anything in wrapping up? Um. I guess the only thing I would say is um, to love yourself, to know that you are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are, that your life, no matter how it looks, is a gift, and, you know. And what's your website if people want to learn a little more about you? Um, the website for women is bemoreyou.co, which is .co, not .com. The website for Grace Happens is gracehappens.com. And the curriculum that I wrote for children of alcoholic families for curriculum and training uh, is I'm so glad you asked dot com. Right. Okay, so people could contact you. Yeah. And you know, it's it's been my pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, and I'm Alex Steven again, hosting Live Your Passion. And I could be reached at alexsteven.com. And I want to share with the audience today, um, my books are out on Amazon. So this is our book, Courage in Our Hearts, A Family's Love Story, written by my wife, Raz, my son, Larry, my daughter, Charisma, and myself. The forward is by Les Brown. And it's out on Amazon, on Kindle, and also as a, a hard copy. So if you want to get that, and we also have an action guide, Discover Your Inner Treasure, and that's my beautiful granddaughter on the cover. <laughs> and, uh, um, so this goes with uh, Courage in Our Hearts. It could be used independently. It's an action guide and accompaniment. And w one of my favorites, I've been working on this for years, and I dedicate it to my elementary school principal, Mr. Bikram Sawitz. Inspirational Life Quotes, a collection for your daily motivation, 365 days of the year. And Trish was looking through it this morning, mm. and she loved the quote, so I'll read it <laughs> to you. Um, the quote for February 24th. Uh, it is one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. Ralph Waldo Emerson. So with that, I want to say thank you, Trish. You are so <laughs> it's welcome. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> and this is Alex Stephen from Live Your Passion. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Provided by Medfield.tv. Access to our community.